Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we have seven games left for the Flames, and the last week of uh, week-long homestand is in the books. Matt, let's jump right in and talk about this weird week for Flames, shall we? Yeah, it's uh, been a very strange time for the Calgary Flames, where win or lose, the, it makes no difference to the Flames in the standings. It's just a very odd time. It's sort of like whose line is it anyway, where the points don't matter. Pretty much. It's just making sure that you're ready for game one of the playoffs. And at this point, a lot of players are playing for personal achievement. And that was the case uh, when the Calgary Flames met the Seattle Kraken in the Dome on April 12th. Johnny Goudreau got his 100 points for the first time in his career. Uh, It's been 30 years since a Flame has had 100 points. So that's quite the achievement there. And this is uh, not only for Johnny, but quite the comeback for the Flames. I mean, by the end of the second, Seattle was up 3-1, to one, and Calgary ends up winning this one 5-3. to three. Yeah, this was not a good performance by the Calgary Flames, despite getting the win. The first 40 minutes, frankly, by the Flames were some of the worst periods of hockey that I've seen this team play since we've started doing this show back in 2013. Like, it was really a bad showing by the Flames. But thankfully, they were playing Seattle, who is admittedly terrible, and they put up a four spot in the third period to say, yeah, okay, good, you had a good two periods, good for you. Now now we win. Matthew Kachuk gets uh, the hat trick in this one, scoring the first, the second, and the fifth goal for the Flames. And we also saw, as you mentioned, not a great game here, but Dan Vladar comes in the third period. Um, We'll talk more about that again in the next game as well. But Vladdy came in, and I I don't think – I wouldn't say that Markstrom played poorly in this one. I think that they just were looking to change things up. What about you? Yeah, it's one of those that because everybody on the ice was playing terribly – um, you need something to shake the team up to get them onto a good page instead of, you know, circling the drain like they were. Do you think it's fair to say in this one that the Flames just lost too many battles? Yeah, pretty much. It it seemed like a, a game where you know that if you try, you'll win easily. So why bother try until it matters? And, you know, like, because of the fact that the Flames starting it on this game uh, had 10 games over the following 18 days, like, they do need to conserve some energy. And playing a team like Seattle, who is very bad, you can play poorly and not give 100% effort and then turn the switch on because Seattle is so bad, you, you will score on them. And... You know, Calgary was just simply able to out-talent them in the third period, and that's how they won the game. Being about talenting, uh, the next game on the 14th, Calgary played the Golden Knights, and I think we're all probably expecting a competitive game here, but this went very differently as the Golden Knights ended up winning 6-1 to one over the Flames. I thought in this one the Flames had a really good first five minutes, and I'd even say a pretty even first period. And I'm not sure what exactly was happening with the Flames, but after that first period... Vegas just got on a roll, scored four in the second and one in the third to end up with a 6-1 win. Yeah, this was a game where you have a team that, like, these points don't matter. And frankly, like, the team's kind of in, you know, energy conservation mode. Vegas looked like a desperate team. And Vegas is desperate to make the playoffs. And even with their efforts, uh, they followed that up with a loss to Edmonton and are you know, in serious danger of not making the playoffs. So their desperation was certainly justified. And it paid dividends in this particular contest because Calgary just did not have anything going for them in this one. You could really tell, um, you know, in the second that Vegas made some adjustments. Like there was a different game being played by Vegas there. But Matt, we saw that uh, Colsar hit in in the uh, the first period and after that just kind of felt like all the flames were focused on was reaping revenge on Colsar. like we had Lucic take far too many penalties just chasing this guy around a few other players tried to take a hit at him it's like you know what we're costing the team by just chasing this guy around 
Yeah, and it was very much to the team's detriment. It, you know, it, it's almost like they would have been better served if they had just started dropping the gloves and punching him. Or, you know, go fight one of the other players or do something productive in that fashion than, you know, playing chase the guy around the ice and not, you know, like lose complete composure. Or pick one guy to just go deal with it and move on. Because it just felt like the, the whole Flames game was just focused on this one guy and they got off their, you know, their game and what made them good because of it. Yeah, and it just a weird, bizarre response from the team. Like normally, like it, when this team has this kind of a situation in the past, like they've had a guy literally just start dropping the gloves with the other player, and they go. And like even if the guy doesn't want to go, you still, you know, kill off the instigating penalty. You know, like that way it's off the books. And, you know, you can carry on with the rest of your game. And instead, it just became a huge and ever-growing uh, distraction for the team until the final buzzer went. Well, the Flames finally got back on their game after that one on Hockey Night in Canada, the 16th. And this was a big win here. The Calgary Flames ended up winning 9-1 over Arizona. Arizona scored the first goal, and it almost felt like a cat playing with a mouse after they catch it. It's like, okay, you guys got to go. We're done playing here. Let's let's show you how this game's going to happen. The Flames scored four goals in three minutes, which is crazy. Yeah, and four goals on four shots. So whether the goalie was there or not, it wouldn't have made a difference. <laughs> you know, my, my grandpa used to watch a hockey game, and you'd look at the end, and you'd be like, wow, the Flames had, you know, 20 shots or whatever. And he'd look at me and say, yeah, but the other guys had eight shots. They're more efficient. Yeah. Um, Matt, when was the last time you can remember a goalie being pulled and then put back in in the same game? Like in this one, we saw the starter pulled, the backup go in, and then the starter go back in. Yeah, unless there's an injury to Vimelka there, it's a very curious thing. I, I think the coaches was probably like, well, Vimelka's going to be our goalie likely next year, so let's just throw the random waiver guy that they got, you know, to the wolves and who cares? At what point do you tell one of them to make sure to make it seem like their ankles hurt? So you can call the emergency guy down instead. Like, yeah, you know, I, I can't remember ever seeing a goalie who gets pulled. If it's not like you said, an equipment issue or something like we've seen guys go out for five minutes, get equipment fixed and come back, but you've never seen a goalie get pulled because they suck and then put back in. Yeah. It's um, very odd. Vladar went in in the Vegas game as well, and uh, Daryl Sutter said in that one that it wasn't Markstrom that was necessarily bad. It was just that he wasn't getting support. Were you surprised that uh, we didn't see Vladar either starting or when the Flames were getting up there, like, you know, in the third period going in when it was 6-1? Were you surprised we didn't see Dan Vladar get the net? Uh, no, I think uh, you have to keep uh, Markstrom as confident as possible. Uh, down the stretch and you know if he's getting shellacked by a team like vegas um you know wh when it's not his fault um it just makes more sense to for him to be able to rebound against the next team the next night i um i was watching this one and as you know the flames are getting eight nine you're thinking wow this is a really good flames team but then i'm sitting there thinking should I be feeling bad for the Coyotes right now? I'd only feel bad for the Coyotes after they move. You know, like, because... After you know, they move to their college arena or after they move out of Arizona? Air, out of Arizona. You know, because, yeah. It was but just... It, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that Arizona is a bad team to begin with, who then sold at the deadline, got worse then have injury troubles and they don't really have a prospect pool. So it's just a confluence of everything's just going great. <laughs> you know, as a flames fan, it was fun to watch this one, but there's that saying that you can have too much of a good thing. And at some point it was like, okay, this is not fun anymore. Like when you're scoring nine to one on a bad team, it's just like, Oh, another goal. Okay. Like, you know, Stop, after, they're already dead. <laughs> yeah, after about the fifth goal, it was like, wow, okay, we've won this one. And, you know, it, at some point it's like, wow, this is not, you know, usually people get excited and, you know, 
everywhere, whether you're at the sports bar or in your living room, the Flames fans are, out, are getting excited. And by the end, it was like, yeah, another Flames goal. Like, it really didn't matter anymore. Yeah. It's like, oh, good. Great. Cool. I was trying to yeah. figure out who didn't have a point so we can give it to them. Like, if, you know, can, can we well, give you, it to... You even saw that uh, in the game with them trying to sub Valimaki repeatedly, or um, Zadorov because it's his birthday yesterday. Yeah. That, here, you know, you score. Go. <laughs> well, that's it. I, I, I was also thinking, like, geez, could we clear enough guys out of the way that Markstrom could fire it down and, and get a goal? Yeah. It was just a very bad performance by Arizona, but, you know... Calgary at least were able to respond after that Vegas game with a better effort overall and frankly went a little Harlem Globetrotters on Arizona there, but, you know, that's always good too. That's probably a good way to say it. That game, uh, that Arizona game was Marshram's 60th start this year, and that's the most he's ever played in one season. That's a very Daryl Sutter number for... Uh, you know, a, a goalie. Daryl likes to run with his starter. Yeah. So after that game, actually technically before that game, the Calgary Flames clinched a playoff spot. They now have 101 points and are sitting first in the Pacific Division, second in the Western Conference with Colorado above them at 116 and St. Louis right below them at 100. In the Pacific Division, however, it's Calgary at 101 with 75 games played. Their record's 46, 20, and 9. Edmonton has 76 games played. They're 44, 26, and 6 for 94 points. So, Matt, technically we haven't clinched yet, but looking at the next seven games, there's really no way Edmonton's going to catch the Flames. No, it would be one of those weird situations where Team A would have to lose all their games and Team B would have to win all of theirs. Pretty much, you know. Like, there's a little bit of leeway in that, but not much. Like, I think the magic number is two and a half wins or and or Edmonton losses you know like that that will be done by Edmonton just losing games between now and the end of the season let alone what Calgary does so I mean Calgary has a back-to-back coming up here but uh technically they they've got what two two yeah two games back-to-back here there could be a clinch by Wednesday if everything goes right Mm mm-hmm not a clinch of the playoffs, sorry, but a clinch of the first in the Pacific. But I think either way, the Flames are going to have that first in the Pacific spot wrapped yeah. up. Oh, for sure. Which helps to narrow the perspective on the who we play in the playoffs because it's going to be wild card team A. And now it's just a matter of figuring out who of Nashville or Dallas will be wild card team A. Well, let's talk about that. So we're going to assume that it's going to be Nashville or Dallas, the Flames play in the first round. There's really not, I mean, you know, we could we could hy- hypothesize over maybe something happens, someone else gets in, but I'd say we're 90% sure it's going to be one of those teams. So Matt, let's break down sort of the pros and cons or what we'd expect to see from each one of those. And why don't we start with Nashville? If Calgary plays Nashville, what do you think we see in that round? Is it a long round? Is it a short round? I think it's going to be more of a short round. Um, Nashville uh, pretty much is Philippe Forsberg, Roman Yossi, and uh, UC, uh, UC Soros. And um, then that's basically it for, you know, like they're an adequately deep team um, that just plays very smart defensively and has decent goaltending. But Calgary has better defense, better goaltending, better forwards, better defensive forwards. Um, other than not having, you know, the best offensive defenseman in the last 30 years on their team, Calgary pretty much beats uh, Nashville in every single facet of the game. I think that if it ends up being Calgary and Nashville, it's going to be a very fast game and a very fast series. I think that's one thing that. Calgary might have to adjust to a little bit. It's just how quick the hockey is going to be. Well, and that's one of the good things with um, that series loss in 2018-19 to the Colorado Avalanche is that the Flames since then have made it an important thing to get players that have foot speed. So, like, while we were caught flat-footed in that series. Like, Calgary certainly can keep up a lot better against a a fast team like Colorado or Nashville uh, than they could a couple years ago. That's true. 
Yeah, I mean, when we look at the roster here, like you were saying, I mean, David Riddick's on that roster. I wonder if we'd see him at all. He's the backup there behind UC Soros. Um, but, you know, looking really at their back end, they've got Matthias Ekholm and Roman Yossi. Those are really the only two defensemen, I'd say, of any note there. Um, yeah. And then on the forward side, Philip Forsberg, maybe Granlin, depending on who you ask. Yeah. And, and and like Ryan Johansson and do I'd say Duchesne's still a pretty big force there too. Yeah, like it's one of those like yeah they do have talented players, but um like if you take the top four players from Nashville and compare it to ours, like our guys blow theirs out of the water, frankly. Yeah, no, I don't I don't disagree with that at all. I think Calgary Nashville to me of the two is the preferred. I would say is the preferred matchup. What about you? How would you say? I think that the Flames win either series, whether it's Nashville or Dallas. But I think that Calgary is better suited to playing Nashville. Um, just because uh, Joe Pavelski and uh, Jamie Benn tend to, and Tyler Sagan all tend to be a little bit of a, a nuisance for the Flames. Uh, whenever we play Dallas, um, but if we play Nashville, let's uh, stay with them for right now. Do you think that it's a four game, five game, six game series? What do you think in there? Uh, five or six. It, I it, think it that... would be like it, they will go as far in the series as Soros is able to carry them. Um, yeah, I think that's fair. You know, like if Soros plays average, uh, the series is done in four. Like, he has to stand on his head to make it a series. And uh, if it, Calgary's ready for the playoffs, yes. Yeah, well, I'm assuming that they will be because Daryl's in charge. So, like, I could see them sort of taking a game to sort of sort themselves out and should be in game one. And that might cause, you know, a five or six game series. Yeah. Basically, Cal the only way Calgary loses this series is if they beat themselves. And I think that's the same case with Dallas. Like, uh, Calgary on a, a talent level in every position outclasses both teams. Uh, but, um, you know, more so even uh, Nashville than Dallas. And, you know, like, it, it's one of those where, you know, if Calgary loses, it's on them for you know, blowing it more than anything. Um, and, and what you're saying there, I think you're, you're probably right that, um, if, yeah, the, I think you're right by saying that they'll go where Saros takes them. Um, and, and I think that if Calgary could come out early and get one game with five, six goals in it and really sort of shake Saros, I think that they could put him. you know, I think they could get him off his game early. Yeah. Well, I think that would actually be the game plan is to blitz him fast and hard and uh, just try to, you know, shake him, basically. Because you know that, like, the Flames players are going to play a very heavy physical style once game one starts because that, that's how they're built anyway. Uh, but, you know, if they can rattle both the team and the goalie, like Nashville's going to be desperate for trying to find any sort of answer. And like Calgary, just on a physical side of things, is a far bigger team than Nashville. So, you know, I think everything kind of points in Calgary's direction with this matchup. I think that having the Flames play that physical game that we see from Daryl Sutter, that Daryl Sutter game that we all know and love, I think that really that is going to get them more success against Nashville and Dallas. I think Dallas is going to sort of come out and play a physical game and sort of equal Calgary in that respect. And I don't know that you can push them around as much, but I think that Calgary can, can play the fast game. Calgary can play the physical game. And I think Calgary could get Nashville off their game early by using those two pieces that we know they're so good at. Yeah. It, to put it in other terms, Dallas can take a punch where I don't think Nashville can. That's probably and, a good way to look at it. Yeah. You know, and um, like while the flames do outclass the stars in every aspect as well, um, you know, Nash or Dallas has a lot more, 
uh, nuisance pieces for the Flames and guys that could get under our skin where uh, if it's the other way around, you know, not so much. Well, let's talk about the Dallas Stars. So they've got uh, three goalies they're carrying right now, Braden Holpe, Jake Ottinger, and Scott Wedgwood. Ottinger and Wedgwood really don't serve much threat to Calgary, so Holpe will be – oh, no, I guess Holpe's hurt, so Ottinger's going to be the uh, starter for that series. Yeah. Um, I, I think that of the two opponents – Nashville has the better goaltending. Yeah. When we look at defensemen for this team, I mean, we saw the Dallas Stars in the bubble year, and I think for me that was probably the best look at these guys that I've had. But Calgary's always had issues with Dallas, as long as I can remember. Um, But there's some players that I was sort of underestimating until that year. I mean, if we look on the back end, John Klingberg, Essa Lindell, um, I think Ryan Suter could still be a bit of a challenge there um, in Dallas. I know he wasn't there when we played them in the bubble, but you know, I think they've got, they have a more complete defense as well and a bigger and heavier defense. Yeah. And it, most of their players are just more, uh, how would you say composed? If that makes sense. Um, like they know um, how to, um push people's buttons um guys like jamie ben uh who can be quite the disturber on the ice um you know uh and then you have uh some young kids of there's uh jason robertson and rue pence who are both very excellent up front like uh, dallas is i think more of a balanced team where they have a little bit of everything I just, agree. Just not to the extent um, that Nat, uh, Calgary does on any front. I think Dallas has more high-end talent potentially. Actually, I'd say Calgary has more high-end talent, but I think Dallas probably has better rounded talent. I think they have more talent throughout the lineup at forward at least. Yes and no. Uh, I mean, I, when I when I look at their centers, they've got, you know, Sagan, Nemesnikov, um, you know, Foxa. Like, I think that there's... Even uh, Rupe they're Hintz. good. I I don't think that uh, they're necessarily better than Calgary. I don't think they're better, but I think they might have more depth. Yeah, I agree. And Maybe that's would, the best way to say I, what I was I trying to say. I think that like the games against them would be more difficult, and you know, um, how would you say stylistically for each of the teams? I, you know, I think that uh, for how each of Calgary and Colorado play, I think Colorado would actually rather face Dallas than Nashville because Nashville's fast like they are and could be annoying to them. And Dallas, uh, I think, uh, is, is a slower team where Colorado could take advantage of that. And Calgary's a little bit slower, uh, more, I think a little faster than Dallas, but not by much. Um, but, uh, they fit stylistically better with Nashville. So I think that's how both the division winners would like it to be. But, uh, knowing that we'll probably end up getting Dallas and that, uh, Colorado getting Nashville and each team having a little bit more annoying of a first round than they normally would. Dallas, I would say is also much more veteran laden. I think Dallas is much more built just in style and in the makeup of their roster to be a playoff team. Yeah, I agree. Uh, um, we, the the, the at... main difference I I feel between, um, say, a team like Dallas and a team like, say, Minnesota or St. Louis is that uh, Minnesota and St. Louis have that one good game breaker up front and a good, really good goaltender. Um, Dallas seems like they're missing that other guy like if they had another player of jason robertson's caliber and like a legit starting goalie i think that uh they'd be up with uh those two guys fighting for second and third in the division instead of uh i think their goaltending is really the achilles heel for dallas yeah but you know it's not to be underestimated like ottinger and holtby are both very good goaltenders uh especially in the playoffs so you know, you can't... Uh, Do we know if Hope th- will be back by the playoffs? I know he's on the IR right now. Yeah, but, you know, like, both of them can elevate their game and be tough to play against. So it's not going to be easy one way or the other. 
if the Flames play Dallas and like it potentially could be an upset. Like I would more confident in that being the upset if that were to happen than Nashville taking Calgary, even though I don't think that Calgary will have much difficulty with either team. Yeah. I think uh, Calgary over Dallas in six, where I think like Nashville would be four or five. Interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm debating that. I think that Dallas is going to be the harder team. I think even some of their depth, you know, looking at guys like Pavelski as, you know, a depth guy, Radulov as a depth guy, like I think that they've got more veteran depth and more guys that know how to play playoff hockey. Yeah. Um, and I think that could – and we're seeing the Flames built that way too. Um, you know, we're seeing the Flames built – for I, w- I would say for the playoffs, they've got a lot more depth guys. They've got guys that you know we we know have playoff experience. Not necessarily the the best guys in the league, but tough guys who know how to play in the playoffs. And I think Dal- Dallas and Calgary is not only going to maybe be the the longer series, but I think the tougher one on the winner as well. Yeah. Well, like, frankly, to me, like, the six best teams in the West are the top three in the Central, Calgary, and the two team wildcard teams. And uh, Edmonton and L.A. or Vegas uh, being the weaker sister of uh, the playoff race. And I think that uh, basically, like, if Calgary can get through either Dallas or Nashville, um it it'll be a lot easier of a second round than the first round um just because i think la or vega or edmonton uh which is looking like the likely matchup in the first round in that series um either of those opponents are a lot weaker than either dallas or nashville um so it i think the flames are going to have a very tough test um whether it uh dallas or nashville but i just think calgary outshines them in each of the categories enough where and that's why calgary, calgary number should... one yeah dallas stars coached by rick boness this year um nashville predators coached by john hines which coach do you like better probably boness even though not overly a fan of boness um i haven't seen enough of hines to really get like a really good feel for him um i'm not really a a ton familiar with his coaching style Um, neither guy has a lot of playoff experience but no i mean if we look at you know uh rick boness dallas 1920 lost in the cup finals so you know at least he's gone that far and and knows what it takes where i think the best let me just double check the best john hines has done is lost in the qualifying round no lo- yeah all first round exits for him yeah he's had a total of, it looks like of three playoff appearances to um bonus is two in terms of seasons in the playoffs but uh bonus has gone further yeah well bonus has also been around for he has. as well bonus is first year coach in the nhl 1988 and yeah. uh heinz first year in the ahl 2010 yeah, which, um, you know, uh, yeah, it, I think that kind of says everything. You know, like, um, it usually takes coaches a while to get themselves cemented. And, like, even uh, coaches that might come up, uh, like uh, uh, Sullivan in Pittsburgh, where he basically came in and won a couple of cups right away, or Barube in St. Louis, like it usually still takes a while to cement yourself as that elite coach uh, for the long term. And like Heinz hasn't done enough to take it to that next level where Bonas has already gone through all of the growing pains and is now like a veteran coach. I like Bonas better of the two. I just think that Bonas is the guy who. Like you said, he's been around forever. He's seen more. I think he's he's more adaptable to different teams. I would rather go into the playoffs with Rick Bonas as my coach. Yeah. So if if we're going to sort of have a coaching battle, I think the Bonas will win that one. 
I, I yeah. feel like, though, looking at the teams, and we won't get too far into the second round here, but I think that the first round could actually be harder for the Flames in the second round. Yeah, like if it ends up being Edmonton versus L.A., frankly, the Flames will mop the floor in the second round with whomever. Like I don't, I it will be tough for either team to win a game in the second round. I give L.A. more credit than I give Edmonton there, but oh, same here. Uh, honestly, I'm expecting Edmonton to get swept by L.A. Really? So yeah, uh, Edmonton's a tire fire. Yeah, uh, Edmonton. Like if you shut down the two guys that can actually do anything, it, they they're like the worst team in the NHL. So you know, uh, and in the playoffs you're going to be keying in on the two guys that can actually do anything. So I don't see Edmonton being able to do, you know, stretch those series out. Like they lost in the qualifying round to Chicago. Like, come on. Um, <laughs> and they haven't really improved. Well, I think Edmonton even more so than Dallas, their big issue is goaltending. Oh yeah. Like uh, Edmonton has the worst and the second worst goalies of any playoff team and like literally two of the worst goalies in the NHL. So yeah, there uh, frankly I don't see Edmonton at all making the second round. Uh unless like both the Cal Peterson and Jonathan Quick get hurt and then several other Kings forwards get hurt like Kempe and Kopitar, <laughs> then you know maybe. But even then I think a depleted Kings roster would still probably beat Edmonton. The thing I think about any of these rosters is that, you know, there's good players throughout, but unlike the Flames, not everybody's having a career year. And I think that's a big part of this Flames team is we're getting a lot out of players that maybe we, you know, shouldn't be or wouldn't be otherwise. Or it's almost like everyone's just coming together at the same time, which is pretty amazing. Well, there's a reason why I wanted the Flames to hire Daryl Sutter all those years ago. Matt, 73% mm-hmm. of our roster, 22 of the 30 players uh, in Flames jerseys ha- are having career years. That's crazy. Uh, I know. and uh, Sutter, um, when he was with L.A., was a master at being able to motivate each player in the way that they needed to to get themselves to that next level. And, you know, coming here um, and working his magic with everybody, am I surprised that the Flames have had this season? No, not at all. Um, I, like, I frankly expected Gaudreau to have his best se- season of his career this year. And, you know, between the contract year and, you know, with Daryl, um, you know, I, I think that everything has just meshed well together. Um, the team... I think with uh, Calgary's past failures um, and, frankly, embarrassing failures to Colorado and even the Dallas series where, like, frankly, the Flames should have won five out of the six games that they played against Dallas in that series um, and then missing the playoffs altogether last year, um, the players have been very receptive of Daryl because, hey, he knows what he's doing. And, you know, he knows how to get us to that next level. And all the players seem to have bought in. And, you know, the Flames are kicking butt. And, like, they're on pace. Uh, They have seven games left. They only need eight points to tie the franchise record for most points in a season, which was in 88-89 with 109. And I could easily see them eclipsing that uh, by going 5-2 and the rest of the way. So... You know, we'll see. Well, let's look at some of these career years. And uh, thanks to the wincolumn.ca for breaking all this down. Um, Johnny Goudreau, as we know, has over 100 points now. His previous best was 99. Matthew Kachuk at 92. Not a lot of people talking about that. Do you think that Chucky's going to get to 100 this year? Yep. His previous best, 77. Mangiapani, 49. He's currently at 30, or his previous best was 32. I think Mangiapane, now I think he's got more than that after last night's game, um, yeah. over 50. Raz, uh, at the time of the writing here, this is before the 9-1 win, so some of these guys could have more there. But uh, Anderson, 46, his previous best, 22. Noah Hannafin, 41, his previous best, 33. Oliver Shillington, his uh, current best, 27, previous best, 14. Uh, Dylan Dubé at 24, his previous best was 22. Tanev, 24, his previous best in points, 20. 
Good Branson, 17 points, his previous best 13. Rujicka, 9, his previous best 3. I mean, he's never really played more than a couple of games yeah. before this. Um, Markstrom his, has uh, 9 shutouts. He's never had a shutout uh, from what I can see. He only had 8 in his whole career yeah. heading into the season. So, um, And then Dan Vladar, 2 shutouts, previous best 0. The guys who are on track for a career year, Elias Lindholm, again, before the 9-1 uh, loss, 74 points, his previous best 78. He's going to – I I wouldn't be surprised if he's got that now, but he'll definitely at least tie that. I think he can get to 80. Yeah. Oh, easily. He'll probably be at around 84, 85 by the time the season's and done Z- or more. Zadorov currently at 16. His previous best is 20, so I think he can get there. And he did get an assist yesterday, so it's 17, 17 now. Uh, Kelly Yarncroke at 28. His previous best, 35. I'm not sure he's going to get there. No. Uh, Tyler Toffoli, 46. His previous best, 58. I don't think he's going to get there. No. Uh, Connor Mackey, current best, three. Previous best, one. <laughs> and, Yay, you've tripled your output. That's right. You've awesome. also tripled the number of games you played. And Ry- Amazing coincidence. And Ryan Carpenter, 12. Previous best, 18. I don't think he will get that career year either. Yeah. The three guys who won't have career years aren't even close include Lucic, Backlund, and Lewis. Three guys who I think we could probably are, agree their best years are behind them. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, even uh, Backlund's having an okay season yep. for Michael Backlund. It's not like he's been bad or anything. It's just... Yeah, it is what his, it is. His best years are behind him. He's sort of north of 30. I think he's still a useful player. But I don't think this is the guy that you're looking at to have, you know, career bests anymore. No. Um, one thing I am hoping for is uh, Gaudreau to hit the 90 even strength points on the season. He's currently on pace to hit 91. Um, the amount of players who have been plus 60 and uh, in the plus minus and having uh, 90 uh, uh even strength uh, points in a season is only like 10 names long and it's like all of the best hall of famers. So that would be like an exceptional list to join. Where's Johnny at right now? I think he's at like 84 or 85 even strength points. He'll get that done then. Yeah. And you know, another thing uh, with uh, Gaudreau's uh, he's now up to, I do believe plus 59 uh, which uh, the best mark since 1990 is uh, Vladimir Konstantinov's plus 60. And there's only been a couple of forwards since 1990 who have even had a plus 50, and that was Mario Lemieux and uh, Peter Forsberg each had one season like that. Uh, so uh, Gaudreau has been exceptional. And, you know, I, like to me... Um, just to uh, go with personal accolades, I do not see how he does not win the Hart Trophy. I would agree with you. Yep. Yeah, because, like, how would you say, like, all the other guys, Matthews, um, Marner, um, Huberdo, McDavid, Dreisaitl, like, they're all in the same point-ish bracket, um, but that plus-minus is just on such a different tier from everybody else. That it's like, it, you know, it's hard to even fathom a player having a plus 50 even as a forward or a defenseman, let alone, you know, a plus 60. And, yeah, Kachuk's a plus 52. But, and, like, that's a testament to his whole line. Like, Lindholm's, I think, at plus 55. I was just going to check 55. 55 after last night. Yeah. And, you know, like, the whole line is basically having like the best year of any team well any well as i said lemieux and uh, forsberg each having one season where they were above plus 50 in the last 32 years you know and like all three of those guys are above that so like lemieux had the best uh forsberg's was an even plus 50 and lemieux was a plus 52 uh and all three of those guys are above that so you know, it's just been an absolutely incredible season for the 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 best line in hockey, and um, you know, I just do not see how Gaudreau, because of how otherworldly that particular stat is, uh, compared to everybody else's, um, 
Like, I just don't see how he doesn't win the heart. After the 9-1 win against the Coyotes, Matthew Kachuk is now at 96. So, uh, you know, we sort of opened the show talking about how, at this point, the Flames points don't matter. They're playing for individual achievements. I think that's the next thing for Flames fans to get excited about is, can we get Kachuk as well to the 100-point plateau? Well, like in the last 25 years, the amount of American players who have hit the century mark in a season include Patrick Kane and now Johnny Gaudreau with Austin Matthews just joining the other day and now Matthew Kachuk, so, uh, who's likely going to join as well. So like it, it's extremely impressive that those two guys are having as good a seasons as that they are. Uh, even from a historical standpoint, like it literally in the last 25 years, only one guy from their country had a hundred points in a season. And now both of them are. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, and it sort of goes back to what we we're talking about earlier that, yeah, both of the flames possible first round opponents have some firepower, but the flames have a better lineup all the way through. And when you've got guys that are going to be on their hundred point seasons, it's going to be tough to outscore the flames. Yeah. Like we literally have the best line in hockey and like, that's not, you know, a speculation or, you know, preferential. It's a clear cut. Well, like, and not even the best than... line, but when I look at even the second line, I mean, Mongepani, Backlund to Foley, you know, you've got yarn and Coleman playing on your third line. That shows you how deep you are. Yeah. Like, uh, um, Coleman and Yarn Crock and Dubé on the third line is better than some team's second line that are in the playoffs. And, yeah, you know, I mean, like, you're not going to go far in the playoffs with one good line. No, and the that's Flames, to their credit, to have... Yeah, which, that's why I think they're going to get swept. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's one of those things where Calgary, like, you know, you can roll all four lines, and the difference between like uh 2018 2019 is that each one of the lines has a physical presence to it um and i think that part of what um caused issues was that the flames didn't really have any pushback um in a physical way uh back in 2018 19 and like if you look at the lines as they are like you have kachuk and to a lesser extent, Lindholm that are willing to engage physically. Uh, Backland and uh, Toffoli can easily push and shove. And we even saw um, Manjapane when he played Dallas that one time go uh, beast mode on <laughs> uh, one of the, a couple of the Stars players. And uh, the third line... We officially call that know, mode jalapeno bread. Yes. It's getting spicy. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, the third line with Yarncroc and Coleman, they can mix it up. And then the fourth line is just bangers galore. So, you know, like it, it, then on the defense, like every, every defense pairing has physical guys. So like there's no escaping uh, physical play and physicality in a playoff series against the Calgary Flames, which I think that a lot of other teams are going to have a hard time with. Because like a team like Nashville, who's fairly much more of a finesse team, like if the Flames match up against them, we're it's going to be a lot like the Flames versus Vancouver that one uh, series where Furlan just like ran over the Canucks, but it'll be like the whole Flames team running them over instead. And you know, uh, it's another dimension. Like we can beat you in the score sheet and in the streets, <laughs> so. You know, it'll be uh, Calgary is going to be a handful for anybody. Yeah, the thing I look at too with these other two teams, I mean, let's start with Nashville. And let's, I mean, if we look at their lineup, let's say that they lose a guy, and, and I, I don't want to say Calgary loses a guy in their top, let's call it their top line, and they're okay. But let's say that Calgary were to lose or, uh, you know, have an injury to one of their uh, middle six guys. I think that there's enough talent on this roster that you can sort of swap guys in and out. Well, say, uh, uh, just for sake of it, say Michael Backlund gets yeah. hurt. Yeah, right? that's, a, that's, a good, that's a good, I think, uh, look at it, yeah. You know, say he gets hurt. Well, you just throw Yarncroc up a line, and he basically fills that role 
more or less. Yeah, I mean, even if, you know, Manjapani gets hurt, you've got Coleman there. Like, we've got enough guys to yeah. backfill. But when I look at Nashville's lineup here, I mean, let's say that they lose Ryan Johansson. What do you got? Cousins and Sisson and Coonan? Like, you, there's a big yeah. hole there. Yeah, If exactly. I look at Dallas, yeah. I mean, if you lose Ben or Sagan, which is your second line, Michael Raffle and Luke Glendening are not going to be your saviors. No, uh, that's, yeah, you're basically done at that point. And, like, you, you look at, um, you know, and then backfilling, like, if in case of injury, like, you have guys like Ruzitska who can easily slot in on the third line. Um, you know, Richie can slot in. Um, other guys can move up in the lineup. Like, it, there's no, like, even Lucic has played for most of the season on the third line. Like, you know, like, there's plenty of different options at their avail, let alone stealing any guys from the farm. And we've, you know, like, and we've seen the Flames change up enough of their lines this year that I think everybody has some familiarity with everybody else. So even if you needed to get physical for one game and you were, say, move Lucic and Dubé around, I think that, you know, we've even seen the top line where we've had, you know, Monjapani and Kachuk switched around. Like, everybody's played with everybody else. So I think that makes having different yeah. lines or showing teams different looks, even for one of the seven games, a lot easier. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, and then also having that flexibility where if, say, a certain line isn't clicking, you can just throw Monjapani up on the first line or, or, or. And, you know, it, there's enough there where we can do that, where other teams are basically forced. Well, we have four guys that can play at an elite level, so they're going to take, like, the top four spots, and, you know, <laughs> the rest is kind of just fill in as needed. And, you know, Calgary, that's one of the reasons why Calgary is going to be really tough to play. In and the it's playoffs, one of the reasons they are number one. Yeah, like... It, you know, um, Calgary, you know, if they had, you know, not gotten COVID and then the whole having to recover from COVID thing uh, back in December, like they could be right up there with Colorado in the standings. Um, you know, it, it's one of those where everything seems to, you know, like Calgary is basically right at the same level as Colorado, uh, Florida, Carolina. Uh, you know, and in that tier of teams and, you know, we're, we're the physical team of those, that bunch. So, you know, it like those teams can just out talent you, uh, but Calgary can also out hit you. Calgary which, can give you a lot of different games and adapt to a lot of different things coming at them. Yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see because Basically, you know, like how, like over the last handful of years, where a lot of the times, like say in that Dallas series, where they got in their own way and like they choked games in the last minute because the the lack of attention to details at, at the end of the games, um, you know, like it at this point, like it's entirely mental for this team, and like if they can just keep focus and concentration which we've seen them do this season um part of the reason why they are first is because they've been able to deal with adversity in games uh, you know if they can keep that throughout like calgary is going to go to the conference finals and you know then it'll be a slug match between the best of the best at that point well, let's not look too far towards the conference finals. Let's deal with the week that's in front of us first. The Flames have, uh, before we look at the week that is, let's look at the week that was. Matt, you won again. Yay. You correctly predicted last week with a Seattle-Arizona win and a loss to Vegas. I was a little more optimistic thinking they'd win all three, um, but it is what it is. They got two of the three, and this week they've got four games ahead of them. They have a road trip, a back-to-back, -back, Chicago Monday night, and Nashville uh, Tuesday night, both those are 6 p.m. start times. So for those of us who have Easter Monday off, we have something to watch and still get to bed early for work on Tuesday. Then there's a one-day break. Thursday night, the Dallas Stars are in town, 7 p.m. start time. And, of course, Hockey Night in Canada on Saturdays, 8 p.m. start time against Vancouver. 
So we see both of our possible playoff opponents this week. What are you expecting the result for the week to be, Matt? Win, 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 win. You're thinking all four. Yep. So Nashville, Chica- Chicago, Chicago, Dallas, uh, and Vancouver. Yeah, because Nashville and Dallas are there. Like if they had been, say, like St. Louis and Edmonton instead, I would have probably said that they would lose those games. But because like these are the teams that we're likely going to face in the first round, the Flames are going to give them a taste of what they're in store for. And they're going to bloody their nose in those games. And I think that they're going to try their best to, you know, show them just how screwed they are. <laughs> and I think that Calgary will come flying in both of those games to, you know, leave an impression. And, uh, you know, I would be absolutely shocked if the Flames lost in anything more than like a one goal overtime type game. Uh, to either team because like i think that it's going to be a complete slugfest but i I think the flames are going to come out on all counts on all four just because chicago and vancouver are not very good interesting um i'm gonna agree with you that i think the flames are going to come out strong in those two games but i think we're going to have a different result in the week i think the flames are going to lose to chicago lose to vancouver but win the two that matter I yeah. think you and I can see that knowing too. what we've seen from the Flames so far, I can very much see this being they come in, they don't have the energy they need against Chicago. They're maybe conserving energy for the Nashville game. I think Dallas, same thing. And I think once they've won those two, you might see a little bit of a mental dip of, well, we're done. Yeah. Could be. It, it's weird looking at the schedule yeah, that we play two games against Nashville in Nashville, both on Tuesdays over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I think that like if there's going to be a letdown game, like the most likely letdown game, it would be the Vancouver one. Yeah, because they'll be like the other two games are very emotionally charged, and then you're playing Vancouver, which who cares? <laughs> you know, blatantly, who cares? Yeah, no, I can I can definitely see that. Um, I think yeah, if there's one that they one that they might not be up for, it'll be that Vancouver game for sure. But mm-hmm. I think that we'll, it'll be interesting to see the Nashville-Dallas game, and we can talk about it next week in our recap, but which team do we think the Flames fared better against or we'd like to see more of? That'll be an interesting discussion to have next week. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and I think that, like, if the Flames can actually manage to beat both of them, then, you know, it won't be giving preferential treatment to one or the other. I like that you call it preferential treatment. Well, we got to beat you both so one of you doesn't doesn't feel left out. Yeah, because it's like, oh, well, you took it easy on Team X, you know, and then if we end up facing them, you know, like it's, yeah. you. D- how would you say it? Daryl Sutter has always been of the mind that you don't want to give anybody locker room quotes or anything like that. Uh, so uh, I think the Flames are going to need to make sure that they give an equal effort to both Nashville and Dallas uh, this week. Um, and put them both through their paces. So that way, you know, if one does actually win, it will be earned instead of, you know, the Vegas game where, um, yeah. <laughs> what are you thinking um, for Dan Vladar this week? Do you think that we see four Jacob Marks from starts? Do you think that we see two? Where Where do you see Vladar, if at all, playing this week? Uh, probably the Chicago and Vancouver games uh, for Vladar. Um if, if it, the Chicago and um, Nashville games weren't back to back, I would have uh, said Markstrom probably all the way through. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, you're going to definitely see Markstrom, I think, in both the Dallas and Nashville games. Dallas and Nashville? Oh, yeah. Okay. Markstrom. Yeah. I, okay. I, I got it backwards there. I thought you meant uh, you'll see Vlar. Yeah. I think you've. There, there's two ways to look at the Nashville-Dallas games. Remember that the Flames played Vladar in a lot of the Colorado games early, or I guess not early, but in the last couple months to sort of, I would say, maybe show them a different look so they can't scout your guy. I could see that maybe happening as well, um, is put Vladar in to show them some difference, especially when you see Nashville twice in a week. Yeah, it, it's one of those where, 
like if they did go Vladar both, that'd be fine. And you know, I, I think it, this week you play Vladar until you, or you play. I I would play just like you said. I would play Vladar Chicago, Vladar Vancouver. I'd play Marks from Nashville and Dallas. Get your your first place in the Pacific clinched, and then I think you play Vladar in the second Nashville game, the one next week. Yeah, and then one game for Markstrom next week. Let Markstrom pick which game three. on the back-to-back he wants. Yeah, and then either Vladar or Wolf in the last game against Winnipeg and, or in Minnesota, one or the other. and Yeah, go go that route. We shall see, Matt. Um, as always, if anyone wants to follow us on social media, we're all over the place. Anywhere that there's there's Flames discussion being had, we're there. On Twitter, we're at Fireside Podcast. Uh, on Facebook, we're facebook.com slash Fireside Chat. On Instagram, we're Fireside Chat underscore podcast. We have a YouTube channel. The best way to get to that is just go to our website at firesidechat.ca and click the link in the header. Um, or if you want to leave a comment on this article, you can do it or on this week's show, you can do it on any of those platforms. You can also do it on our site at firesidechat.ca. On our website, you can also find a way to leave us a voicemail and um, how to email us. We'd love to hear from you about who you think would be the best first round matchup. Maybe you think we got it right or wrong. Let us know, but we'd love to hear from you and what you're thinking as the flames go to the playoffs, Matt, seven games left. Let's enjoy these last seven. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how things just shake out for all of the various playoff series. Like you, you already know that like, uh, St. Louis and Minnesota are going to play each other in the first round. Um, us and Colorado are getting Dallas and Nashville. Um, Edmonton will have home ice in the first round, <laughs> whether they're playing LA or Las Vegas and the East, it's a jump ball basically on all the matchups. Like, uh, Toronto can be playing either Tampa or Boston. Florida is going to be playing the Washington capitals. Um, Carolina could be playing any of a handful of teams and, or the Rangers and, the worst will play the penguins probably so yeah it's it, still everything's a little up in the air but uh it'll be nice to get some more clarity and uh start like actual prep for game one of uh the first round and hopefully by our next episode we'll have a clearer picture of it's likely going to be nashville or it's likely going to be dallas unless the final week goes weird and that kind of thing. Well, you look at Daryl Sutter as the savior of hockey, so let's follow the Daryl Sutter mantra and let's not look too far ahead. Let's look at what's right in front of us. Exactly. And as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.